17 U.S.C. 107 federal law allows citizens to use copyrighted media for fair use. That is criticism, news reporting, teaching, and parody. Kuma, Yahoo, we are put to you there, sir. We are new to me, sir. We are new to me, sir. Arise of you, Lord, your friend. Oh, Yahoo. Kuma, let your enemies be scattered, and let those that hate thee flee from before thee. Let all of Yashara, Yisrael, who love, worship, and praise Yahweh, give him thanks by saying hallelujah. Shalom and welcome to Into All Truth. We welcome donations and we thank you everyone for donations that you made for calendars and cookbooks, which the update should be coming out before the new Hebrew year, the new Israelite year. Make a donation of $35 or more at livelightwell.com and you'll go get both the calendar and the Hebraic lifestyle Chaya Eat Life and Fast book. We'll get the calendar and the cookbook. Just remind me to send you an update once you've purchased it with a proof of receipt. We thank you for everyone who's donated. And I pray that as you listen to this study, that the Ruach HaKodesh will lead you into all truth and show you things to come. Baruch Atah Kulam in the name of Yahusha Hamashiach. Amunah. All right, so this is all about Prester John, and this is a complicated subject. So, the Kabbalah says that in order to make someone into a slave, you have to make them white, blanco, into a tabla rasa, a blank slate. Blank is what black means. A blank slate transformed into a thing or slave of your making. Part of that is erasing memory and mixing with the white soul of the bleached seed of the fallen. So this is a continuation of the shift of the identity from Jacob to Esau and back again, because Esau is the end of the world and Jacob is the beginning of it that follows. This is the rise of the fourth man, who is really Prester John. He's the mixed multitude. He's Esau and Nimrod. He is Egypt, which Esau inherited Egypt. And But there is an actual fourth man beyond Esau who comes along, but this is part of that story. So Jeremiah 25, 8 says, Therefore thus saith Yahuwah, since ye believe not my words, this is what he says to Israel, Behold, I will send and take a family from the north and bring them against this land and against the inhabitants of it and against all the nations round about, and I will make them utterly waste and make them a desolation and a hissing and an everlasting reproach. And I will destroy from among them the voice of joy, the voice of gladness, the voice of the bridegroom, the voice of the bride, and the scent of ointment and the light of the candle, and all the land shall be a desolation, and they shall serve among the Gentiles 70 years. And when the 70 years are fulfilled, I will take vengeance on that nation and will make them a perpetual desolation. And I will bring upon that land all my words, which I have spoken against it and all the things that are written in this book. So we know there were a couple of captivities that went for 70 years, but also, you know, there's the prophecy of Daniel. But anyway, so is all about Esau as the fourth man and even the the more corrupted seed that comes out of that we'll get to in other episodes but he has a connection to the fourth man because he is the inheritor of the kingdom of of Nimrod and so he is the king of Egypt and they knew the Egyptians knew the fourth man was coming because of course Shem, Abraham, and Isaac, everybody knew about him and promised him to the Egyptians and, of course, Nimrod. Of course, Nimrod and Nebuchadnezzar saw the fourth man, who is Yahusha, 
Jesus Christ, the Messiah, in the midst of the fire and knew he was coming. So there's the fourth man, Yahusha, who is proclaimed by the scattered tribes. And then there's the Antichrist embodied in Prester John as the false priest and false messiah. So when, when they talk about all these other nations who have their own Christ figures and the, and the Messiah, Yahusha, is not real, they knew he was coming. They were told about him because it was a promise to unto all the nations. Now, is something that's important for you to know is that the scripture, Yah, calls the end from the beginning. So there are many battles with the seven nations. Okay, and the seven nations come out of Mount Seir, uh, Mount Horeb, Hermes, where the 200 angels descended and mixed in with women, okay? And we know that Abraham went to war with those seven nations. And we know the 12 tribes of Israel went to war against those seven nations. And so they are related to Egypt and the fallen and the seed of Satan. So that, and Nimrod was a giant. He was Raphaim. And so when Esau killed him, he inherited that kingdom, Babylon, the kingdom of the Raphaim. According to Lost Tribes and the Promised Land, the Israelites seem to have wandered eastward from their original exile to the Oikomeni. Now, these are the maps. We're going to look at some of them, but I don't think they're the authentic ones because they're crudely rendered. There are a series of maps that show these kings, these Prester Johns, and there is one in particular that shows a monarch with a three-pointed crown, the only king, by the way, who is standing on the whole map, holding out branches of golden fruit towards his followers, nobles, clergy, peasants, and bourgeoisies who are gathered around him in various postures of obsolescence. They are surrounded by trees, flowers, and more of the golden fruit, all suggesting a domain of abundance and tranquility. How can this man be anything but a savior? But there is nothing of the traditional imagery of Jesus about him. On the contrary, the inscription reads, Antichrist. He will be reared at Chorazan in Galilee, and when he is 30 years old, he will begin to preach in Jerusalem, and contrary to all truth, he will say that he is Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, and it is said he will rebuild the temple. All right, the second mention of Jesus is on the Catalan map, and then it is in the context of that what hardly seems Christian again. So the map seems to say contrary to all truth is this claim made. It's very ambiguous. So this is very much Esau playing two sides. The right hand doesn't know what the left hand is doing, and the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. So we have a combination of Israel fleeing and scattering to the four corners of the earth, while Esau takes over his kingdoms. And, of course, Alexander the Great was descended from Esau. And it, what it says here is that we must consider a, another relevant tradition. Many Jews and some Christians as well well believed that the peoples walled in by Alexander the Great were not Gog and Magog, but the lost tribes of Israel. Some resolved the matter by considering the lost tribes Gog and Magog <laughs> to be one and the same. And others went on to conclude that the Tartars were the lost tribes, but of course the Tartars were fallen angel seed. For in the remotest corners of the earth, near the inscription on these kinds of maps of this Antichrist to come, it says, further out on the unknown ocean sea beyond Asia, yet another inscription reads by Isaiah the prophet, I will send those that escape of Israel in, unto the nations in the sea, into Africa and Libya, and to the islands far off that have not heard of me and have not seen my glory, and they will announce my glory to the nations. What I want to show you is these are the various images of Prester John. And uh, one is by Smirnoff to the left, where he looks, he's looking very Mongolian, very kind of Chinese-y, uh, but this is an image of a Prester John, because Genghis Khan was a Prester John. And the Prester John was to come out of the Abyssinians, okay? The Abyssinians, and there are many associations with Abyss Abyssinia. It's Sino. Abi means father, Sino, so the father of Sino, the father of Canaan, the father of the Chinese, which is Canaan. Eos in Greek means age, 
Okay, so father of the age of sin. All right. So I am just putting forwards that this is truly Esau and that he moves from the kings of Israel to the kings of Israel sinning and then Esau takes over the identity. Okay, but this is what Abyssinios means. Sino, like I said, is the son of Can, Can Canaan. Khan is another name for Canaan. And this is the age of the Raphaim, the dead things that come up from out of the sea, the other offspring, the seed of Satan. And you can see here that it says El Preste Juan. So this is Spanish. Emperador de los Abyssinios. So the fathers of the age of sin were the fathers of the Canaanites, the Mongolian horde, who are mixed with the Raphaim. Ishaba, Ishaba, Ishaba. This is the Ethiopian for Abyssinia or married to Abba, but it becomes Abyssinia. Abyssinia means, which means a mixed multitude. Babylon defined means confusion by mixing. So this is the horde. The abyss in the lower parts of the earth or hell is called Tartarus. That's the Hebrew word for it. Tartarus, Tartaria, Tartarus. So this is where the Mongolian horde comes from. Ethiopian is also drawn from the term utopian. Because you'll see, as we talk about Prester John, there's all this mystery around him and this utopian society he has that you can dream of across the sea because this is the myth of this great kingdom, this utopia that will be built. The Egypt that is covered over with mounds and buried, and then out of that rises up Babylon. And those who live in Babylon who are deceived by it will never really realize that it's Babylon because that was hidden. Okay? And the people who help create this are the people coming up out of Tartarus. Why? Because they're Raphaim. They're mixed with the Raphaim. All right? And so this is Sin, Sino, Canaan, the fallen seed. All right? So this is one of the first Prester Johns in the region of what we call Asia. And I'm going to go into directions soon. So there's a whole order and identity theft and transition that goes from this that actually matches the journey of Joseph uh, and his sail to the Midianites, to Ishmael, to Esau, and then Esau takes over and then he, Moses, returns Israel back to the promised land through his marriage to Zephora, the daughter of the Midianite priest. The priesthood is returned to them and it has been kept by the Midianites, okay, in the land. And so this is really about that journey of kings and how Yah allows Hasetan to do it through Esau and these various nations. Now, when Israel was sent into captivity, and they had many captivities, Abraham and Isaac went captive to Egypt. Uh, Jacob went captive to Laban. And then Joseph went captive at the hands of his 10 brothers to the Midianites. Okay, the Midianites were the descendants, was one of the sons of Keturah and Abraham, the second wife of Abraham. They then traded him to the Ishmaelites, who then sold him to the Egyptians. And then Esau and his wizards and some of the leaders of Egypt, Ramses I and II, were also descendants of Edom. We're going to show you. And so when, when Israel was captive in Egypt, the wizards of Baal, so Balaam and Janus and Jambres. Janus and Jambres were from Chiptum, okay? Which is where a woman named Jan Jania came from. And Janus and Jambres were also from Chittim, which became Rome. Those were also descendants of Esau mixed with Japheth, okay? These wizards and these kings kept Israel captive in Egypt with their spells and magic and their authority. Now when Egypt was when Israel was heading out of Egypt, 
Then the Midianite Jethro, the same Midianites, Midianites who bought Joseph and, and sold him to Ishmael. Then Jethro or Ruel and Zephora, his young daughter, were a sanctuary for Moses. And Moses married Zephora. And so they remained in the land of Israel and kept the priesthood until it was time for Israel to return. I want you to know about Dan and Ephraim as well, because Dan becomes a snare for Israel, and so does Ephraim, and they aren't part of the 144,000, although Joseph is, because Joseph was split into two tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh. So Joseph is still counted, but Ephraim goes by the wayside because of Haman, who builds the temple for Solomon and the pyramids for Solomon. Okay, so he goes into corruption, he has them worshiping fallen gods, and Dan is also part of that. All right, so there is a whole pattern here that we're going to follow throughout history. And this is the code. This is the Kodesh set apart way. And so this pattern repeats over and over again. And Esau is trying to what? He's trying to overcome Jacob, as was his promise. So we're going to look at Roland Saunders' Lost Tribes of the Promised Land. We're going to read from that and a number of other books. Let's just start off with this, though. So we're going to kind of jump in at two points. We're going to jump in at the fall of the temple. And then after that, we're going to jump in uh, during the conquests, the Muslim conquests of Europe. And in these climates, because there was so much chaos and the Negroes were still ruling the world and Prester John or Esau was still trying to take over these empires, the transitional period, and Israel was being scattered, then the Europeans in the north, we're not talking about the Greeks or the Romans, okay, the Greeks were mixed in with Israel and the Romans were mixed in with Esau. We're talking about the farther reaching Gentile nations. And this doesn't include Tarshish because Tarshish, their ships went everywhere. So they were doing all kinds of things. But we're talking about the masses who didn't, were not raised in the resplendent glory and education and most of all, the spirit of Yahuwah that Israel was and the Shemites were who are all over Africa, because Africa is the land of the Shemites. So they were in Europe, and they were in a state of ignorance. The masses were, okay? And the, a lot of those tribes of Japheth. And so they would hear these stories about these distant lands as they were rising up and being converted and beginning to understand the scriptures and the way of Yah according to his promise to them. So at the time, what the Europeans might see are these ancient maps, maps like of Oku, Mene, and they would see images of black magi riding horses or camels through the desert um, or somewhere in the fabled capital of Cathay, Asia. And, you know, they might be a recurring kind of a figure. They would have more of a sort of anthropological picture of this land. They weren't familiar with Ethiopia or the south or the eastern places like Asia. I see some images of black kings. But then what would arise would be this image of these particular black kings in West Africa, bearded and draped in austere undecorated robes and with these regal frames on these maps and he he would be carrying a scepter in one hand and a gold nugget in the other as in this image and this is known as Musa Mali or the lord of the negroes of guinea and this king was supposed to be one of the richest and most noble noble lords in all of the region on account of the abundance of gold that is gathered in his land and then you'd see this portrait of Mansa Musa, who reigned from about 1307 to 1332 as king of Mali, ruling the empire of that region as Ghana had been before it. And then you would see around 19, well, sorry, around 1324, Mansa Musa had gone on a pilgrimage to Mecca. So then he's on the other side of the country. And then he would be also known to be somewhere in Timbuktu, the capital of the of world-renowned hiring a celebrated architect from Moorish Spain to design buildings for it. 
and um, and then the Muslim would be residing there. And now there it talks about how there was a Catalan abs, atlas that um, paid tribute to a portrait of him, and he's it's sort of honoring the trans-Saharan trade, and which brought um, a lot of trade to Moorish cities in North Africa and thence into European markets. And of course, quote, black slaves as well. This would be the Hebrews at this particular time. And also in these maps, there would be islands and so on placed beneath Asia. So this is, I guess, towards maybe Australia and stuff. And this would be these unknown parts of the ocean, um, the medieval inexactitude of this era, which characterizes the whole easternmost section of the map. So this is how... You know, I don't have images necessarily of these maps, but this is how the Europeans are perceiving these foreign lands that they've never been to because it wasn't the norm for them to travel there. It says the two black kings of the Catalan Atlas, that's this one, of course one's white, so this can't be the right map, but they're saying it is. Um, tell us something about the European vision of the darker races of mankind of that era. The old, an old world relationship with the African race that has been known to Europeans since antiquity and achieves a certain clarity and in the other case makes out only the dimmest outlines of a relationship yet to come. There are misrepresentations on both sides and the brilliant golden light in which Africa is seen softens the dark shadows of servitude that will soon come. The Jews of, the black Jews of Mallorca are among the first ones they talk about in the book. As I've said before in my other videos, north, south, east, west is all confused. Well, east and west in particular. All right, so let's keep going. Prester John, here is what we get from the New World Encyclopedia and the Jewish Encyclopedia. All right. Who was Prester John? Tiglat Pileser. Okay. Who was Tiglat Pileser? Prester John. This is the Hebrew form of the Akkadian Tukulil Apil Eshara, meaning my trust is in the son of Isara. Isara being the main temple dedicated to the gods of Ashur in the city of Ashur or Assyria. So Isara, right, was the king of the Neo-Assyrian Empire from 745 BC to his death and one of the most prominent and historically significant Assyrian kings and is widely regarded as the founder of the Neo-Assyrian Empire. Again, this is Esau. The name is right there, Isara, Ishara. So this was one of the first Prester Johns. The Edomites called themselves Jews historically at a certain point during the book of Esther. And in the book of Esther, they had this Esther and Mordecai, her uncle, who were two Benjaminites, were in captivity to the Medo-Persians. And Esther married Osiris. And Haman had gone against them. Haman was a descendant of Esau who was a descendant of Amalek, the son of Esau. And so Haman, the priest, had come against them many times. All right? And when Osiris sided with the people of Israel, the king commanded that they were able to have vengeance against those who sought to attack the Jews. All right? So let the Jews have vengeance against their attackers, which would be the Edomites. And so everyone in the province and in every city, wheresoever the king's commandment and his decree came, the Jews had joy and gladness, a feast and a good day. And many of the people of the land became Jews for fear of the Jews fell upon them. So in other words, rather than be avenged, they said, oh, we're Jews. Don't come, don't come and avenge against us because we're Jews too. We're Jews too. Don't, don't take any vengeance out on us because we're Jews too. Okay, so that is what happened. If you can't beat them, join them. So there is so much depth and research to 
the story of the man and the mystery of Prester John that I could not do it justice in just one video here, but I'm just going to try to codify it for you guys. I'm going to try to bring it down to the Yuhusha code, to the Kodesh set apart scriptural code, to just kind of figure out who he is and um, whether or not he's real. And of course he is real. Uh, it's just all about the transition from Jacob to Esau and from black to white that obscures his history because of course he's the ruling conquering kings of Judah and Israel who are spread to the four corners and Esau chases him with Dan in the lead or in the rear <laughs> and then the kingdom is given over to the Gentiles so that's why his history clearly is so hidden and convoluted. Uh, we have Esau trying to claim it and make him into a serpent worshiper and a Khan. And then, of course, the ten tribes are mixed in with him and they're subservient to him. But, of course, they would have conquered many lands for him. And, of course, because Sheba and Keturah... Uh, are mixed in as well through the lines of Abraham and Moses and Dawid, then we do have those true Davidic lines mixed in through the Eritreans. So I'm going to try and do what I can to cover this because there's a lot of references to Septimus Severus, uh, to him ruling over the seven kingdoms or being the seven kingdoms or the seven mountains of the earth or the seven masses of the earth which is referred to in revelation so you know it's a lot of stuff to cover and so i'm just gonna try and give you some general do some reads from some books of course the and a couple of articles and websites I'll try and provide some cohesiveness with it, but I think the thing that's going to become more, most clear in all of this is the difference between Esau and Jacob, and of course the all of the relationships with the descendants of Abraham and the roles they played in the captivity of Israel to Egypt and their release. So that's always the overriding code so one thing I want to show you very clearly is that throughout this lesson, we're going to see the difference between Esau and Jacob. And these are going to be very fine differences, as I've shown you before. And this is the twinning of Esau in the identity of Jacob. They were twins. Okay. All right. And so you're going to see that Solomon is a title that is taken by Esau. Solomon was a king and a leader and a person, and then it becomes a title. So the Masons use Solomon as a title to initiate Masons. And there's actually a son who's descended from Herod named Salome. And there's a Salome that talks about the Solomon Islands and all this kind of stuff. This is, sorry, I've got spelling mistakes here. This is Esau acting in that false identity and title of a King Solomon type. Israel had the true King Solomon. So Jacob's on the right, Israel's on the left. Jacob is the right hand, Israel is the left hand. So I want you to understand, this is why the scripture says, don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. This is why the book of Jasher talks about the secret left hand of Yah. And when you look at, at the images of Shem, Ham, and Japheth that I've shown you through all these videos, you'll see they all have two left hands because that's how they're painted on the Egyptian temples with two left hands because they're serving Esau. They're serving Egypt. Don't let the right hand know what the left hand is doing. So Solomon is used as a title. Like I said, now J J David is also used as a title, even though there was a true King David who was a king and a priest. He wore the ephod. He danced before the ark as it was brought into the temple. And he ate the showbread. 
The priest wears an ephod. An ephod is not a loincloth because David was both king and priest. He was the first king priest. Okay. Prester John is like the prophet John and the apostle John. Okay. So it's a title that is taken from these two prophets, priests, and apostles. They were in high regard in the view of Yahusha, the Messiah. Okay. Korah is also going to be stolen. The priests of Korah were the descendants of Levi, like Moses and Samuel and Aaron. Okay. So these were the Levites. So they have a Korah as well. The twinning effect, right? So Judah, there was a tribe of Judah on the right hand side in Israel, the true tribe of Judah, the leaders of Israel, the lion out of which the king and priests came. So they have a Judas as well. They call themselves Jews. And they had a Judas Iscariot who was a Karaite. He was from Karaite. We're going to see what, what that more information on that. We're also going to see that among the Ethiopians, because the Ethiopians through Zephorah and Moses, through Keturah and Abraham, through David and Sheba, okay, and through Solomon and Sheba, there was a union with the Ethiopians repeatedly through those uh, Midianite lines that grafted them into the priesthood and kingdom. Okay, so that became the Zagwe dynasty. It was then overthrown and usurped by Amalek. Okay, Amalek, Yakuno Amalek. So that's who Haile Selassie was. He was an Edomite. He says Amalek overtook this kingdom. And so this kingdom, which was coming from, like I said, it's going to be the same pattern as the captivity of Joseph, right? The Midianites, then Ishmael gets mixed in. And then afterwards, Dan, you're going to find, acts as a transition over to Esau as well, just like the other brothers do, because Janet, Dan is a traitor. Tribe of Dan is a traitor. He's a serpent in the way. He's a serpent in the eagle. And Esau is an eagle too, and so is Egypt. So he overtakes the Ethiopian kingdom, all right, as Am Amalek. So that's since about the 1300s, Esau took over the identity of Ethiopia. Now, Israel calls themselves, sorry about the spelling, guys. Israel calls themselves Israel right? Israel calls themselves Israel. But Isaac's sons call themselves Saxons, Isaac's sons. Esau's sons call themselves Isaac's sons because they're not Jacob's sons. Now, why is Israel going to run around and call themselves Isaac's sons, Saxons? They have no reason to whatsoever. None. Because they're Israel. But Isaac sons are Esau's son. And so this is how Esau worms his way into the identity of Israel. Now we're going to find out there's a difference between nega, which is like a priest or a prince versus negad, who is a prince, a noble prince in Israel, the Hebrew word. So you see these are fine differences. And then there's a difference between Africa, the word Africa, and the descendants who come out, who have that name, so descendants of Keturah, descendants of Judah, and descendants of Manasseh have the name Africa. But then the Egyptians, descendants of Ham, use the word Pharaoh, a Pharaoh, which relates to the dust of the earth that is spitten, and out of it comes flies when Moses delivers Israel. But the words sound very similar, and the names of the lands sound very similar. So east is west, and west becomes east because of these fine differences. Also, 
as I said, Esau calls himself Jews, Jushi, Jutes. Israel calls themselves, well, the southern kingdom, Yahudi, Yahudi, because it's Yah is at the beginning. So like I said, west becomes east and east becomes west. So this is what we have to unpick. Now, prester, prester, presbyter has the word house in it. House of prester. So press, can, prester can also mean um, Zane, but we'll go into that, or John, right? So Johanna means chosen of Elohim. So there's no J's in Hebrew. So this is Johanan or Yehokanan. It has to do with Enoch or Hana, seed of Anna, seed of Israel, Yohana, okay? So the chosen of Elohim, that's what Presbyter relates to. But we know that Solomon had the widow's son build his temple, who was from the tribe of Ephraim, right? And so there was this king, Shalamanser, who was from the Babylonian king. It's the same kind of name, Solomon. So this is when Solomon's name is exploited because of the whole Masonic movement that comes from Solomon because he is unfaithful. And he, he mixes with all these different wives and nations. And so the seed is corrupted. So Solomonser, King Solomonser is a Babylonian king. And notice, and this is associated with the term Nestor. Okay, well, who, what makes a nest? An eagle. All right, so what do we learn about the Karaite Jews? Well, they descend from Judas Iscariot. All right, Matthew 10 says, Simon and, and the Canaanite and Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, Yahusha. These are the Karaite people. So Judas Iscariot, he came from Karaoth. Iscariot is not a word in any known language. It is believed to be a corruption of the Hebrew word Ishkariath. Kariath was a small village on the southward extremity of the territory of Judah, about 15 miles south of Hebron. This territory was occupied by the Edomites. The Edomites descended from Esau, who took wives from the line of Ishmael, and also from the Canaanites. Ishmael, we know, is the son of the flesh, and they are not the all right, and so this is what the Catholic Dictionary says about Prester John. The name of a legendary Eastern priest and king, the fabulous wealth of the head of this supposed Christian kingdom in the Far East furnished abundant material for writers in the Middle Ages. Um, Wolfram von Eckenbrock in Parsifal, this is what they're saying was the rumor or the, was the story. But according to Marco Polo, Prester John was Unk Khan or Un Khan for centuries. That is Prince of the Cariots. Prince of the Cariots, a Mongolian tribe, was believed to have um, to be Prester John of the legends. His sacerdotal character. So the Sarsarians were Isarians, was considered due to the fact that he might have been dedicated to the priesthood in his cradle, according to the Nestorian custom, nesting eagle custom. In Jerusalem, early in the 15th century, the Abyssinian priests described their country to the Portuguese merchants as the kingdom of Prester John, which accounts for the persistent search by the Portuguese discoverers of that century for the kingdom and for the king himself along the coast of Africa and the East Indies. Karaite Judaism. All right. Karaism. Now, Kara does refer to the East, okay? So Karaite Judaism, Karaism, they maintain all of the divine commandments handed down from Moses that were written in the court, the, Quran, the Torah, without additional oral law, Torah. But the Karaite Jews do not consider the written collections of oral tradition 
in the Midrash or Talmud, uh, Talmud as binding. So this is the section of Jews who are going to stick with the true Judaism. All right. And so they stick to a, a plain meaning, but we're just trying to show you where they're coming from. They're coming from Esau. And they have a, the Carians from the hinterland of Mel Meletus enter history as mercenaries in the service of the Egyptian king, Samtik, and with, along with their Ionian or Greek neighbors in the seventh century. So that gives you an idea of who they are. So I want to make this distinction here with the word Africa, and I've done this in other videos. And so this is from Asiatic Researches, and it talks about the fact that um, the Bengali and the Burmas pronounce this word differently, Afara, and it means different things. All right, let's start here. Afariam or Ifriam, okay, and Afaria are regular derivative terms from Afara, and from them is obviously derived Iberia, the ancient name of the western parts of Europe. Remember, east is west and west is east, including Gaal and Spain. Homer uses in that sense the appellations of Hyperia and Aphra. So this is what Africa is named after. First Kings 9.28, we've already gone over this. And they came to Orphor and fetched from thence gold 420 talents and brought it to King Solomon. So this is the land of Shem. And this is how you spell Ophir here in Hebrew. Aleph, Ah, or Wa then the face, the, the uh, yod, and the resh. This is afara. So you've got the head leader, you've got a state of awe, you've got his face or mouth, you've got the right hand and the head leader. So this is really speaking to reducing to ashes in some cases, which happens to Israel, or it's a land or a city in southern Arabian, Arabia in Solomon's trade route where gold evidently was traded for goods characteristics of fine gold, fine gold. So this is Strong's H211. So that's one of the meanings. So I'm going into this because this is differentiating the Shemites from the Canaanites. All right. So this is the Egyptian Canaanitish Isarian version of the same sounding word and it's a, with an iron and mouth or face and leader so this is the all seeing eyes face and leader this word strong's h6080 all right so david and his men went by the way and shemi went along the hills over against him and cursed as he went and threw stones at him and cast dust on his head so dust dry earth powder ashes and the, what you, did Yah say to Moses? Stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land. So this is what's associated with this word, Pharaoh. Or the West, America, North America is Pharaoh. Africa is awe Pharaoh. It's awe of Yah. They have an awe for Yah. All right, and so we see Here's another word for it, and it starts with the tent peg, wa. It doesn't have the aleph, it's just aleph, and then it has the watchful eye, ayin, and the mouth and the head, or the face and the head. But the thing is, it's secured by awe, all right? It has the face and the head and a watchful eye. And so Ezra, um, the, these, uh, the sons of Ezra, one of them is named this Afar, okay? And this is actually a descendant of Judah. And then the children of the half-tribe of Manasseh were also named this same word, Afar. Now, I may interchange this with Ephraim. I sometimes get it switched around, so forgive me if I do. But it's the same word. 
awe for the watchful eye of the face of the leader. That's what they had. They had awe for Yah. Okay? And then we find also that Keturah had a son, Midianite, that Jethro and Zephora came from. Zephora married Moses. And his one of his sons' name was Ephraim. So he had awe for the face and watchful eye of the leader, Yah. Okay? But sometimes he did. All right? And so he kept, he, Jethro kept the scepter and the sapphire staff of Joseph. And he, they, the Midianites dwelt in Mount Sinai until Israel reclaimed the land. So what has happened before will happen again. Who are the Midianites? They dwell in the tents of Kedar. What does the Song of Solomon say? Black, black. I am black, is what the Shunammites said, like the tents of Kedar. So the Hebrews were black-skinned. All right? So these are all... These are Shemitic people, even slightly half Hemetic in some cases, okay? As usual, when we're dealing with Prester John, we're dealing with the whitewashing of history, iconoclasm. Man or myth, Prester John played a great role from the 12th century until well, well after the discovery of America. He was an established part of the European pattern of thought. A potential Christian ally in the rear of the Muslim foe, he figured in the plans of later crusades and thus had a place in European ideas of world strategy. Prester's importance may be taken for granted, but questions do arise regarding his origin, admitting that he was in the larger sense, a legend, it is still in order to ask whether he was in some degree also a historical personage. And one thing is certain, he leaped to fame overnight in Europe on the strength of a letter sent ostensibly by him in 1165 to the Byzantine Emperor Manuel Comnenus and undeniably forwarded by that ruler to the Holy Roman Emperor Frederick Barbarossa. This letter, while not the first document to use the name Prester John, is the basis of his legend, and for centuries thereafter, Europe had no substantial doubt of its authenticity. authenticity sorry. Indeed, a wondrous concoction, the Prester describes himself as ruling in India. Okay, so we've talked about that before, and it says here, a geographical expression that to Europeans in 1165 and much later meant nothing more specific than a land lying to the east. Exactly, because both Africa and India are Prater Shem's land, and so is Persia or South America, as I always go into in the videos. So there's, and there's the West Indies, which are central in the waters. And so he was ruling over the, those lands because, as I said in the other videos, the Europeans had decided to hide the West. And it's really important in this whole transition that we look at Esau because Esau, as I've said before, he goes and he, the role he takes on now is he's hiding the West through various of his relatives in the West who are ruling in the, in like the European empires through, for example, the Romans and the Greeks, they decide to hide the West, as I've shown you in other videos. And so the job he takes on is that he takes over this identity of Prester John, and he goes to the West. Because what? He gets Nimrod's birthright, right? After killing Nimrod, he, he stalks Nimrod, who's walking in the wilderness, and all his mighty men and people are, not, are removed from a distance, and then... He lurks for him in the wilderness, and then he goes and he slays him. He starts suddenly from his lurking place, draws a sword, and cuts off his head. So what he does is he inherits the Babylonian Empire that way. And so, as I've said in, in all my other videos, he basically goes into the West and cleans it up and prepares it for Babylon, or rather messes it up, destroys it, and prepares it for the final Babylon. 
And so that's kind of his role. And so it happens through this whole transition and he uses the Moabites who get per him, okay, to do that. The Moabites receive permission from the pharaohs of Egypt to settle and inhabit Northwest Africa and the Moroccan Empire. And then they cross yet to Atlantis and into South and Central America and they get land there also. So what's happening is that the nations take a council against Israel. They take a council against Israel and in particular, it's all the brothers, the descendants of Abraham take a council and they take over all of Israel's lands and, and they work with Esau to do that. And that includes the Moabites, right? But Esau takes on this kind of fourth man identity. Some of the things that are associated, if you go to this Sambali blog spot, it says that the Ethiopians and Prester John is a visual multi-ethnic said to be of a polka dot complexion. And this is why the scripture says, can, can a leopard change its spots? Neither can the Ethiopian change the color of his skin. And of course we see, this is Esau who mixes in with all these nations. And we see these symbols. This is a symbol of the West. We see a polka dotted guy. We see a, black, a brown skinned guy and a black guy, right? And then we see various polka dotted people. We see polka dotted clothes. This is, and we see people with polka dot skin, like semi leprous skin. It's like a mixing of different nations. We see the jaguar and leopard pattern in Egypt. Okay. And as I said before, the Phoenicians, that's who Esau is. He's the Sabians and the Phoenicians. And we'll get into that. The Greeks called them Ethiopians, and they had great operations beyond the pillars of Hercules. This is in the book Ancient America, page 171. So this is this is the empire that Prester John takes over, right? And it's operating through all of these groups of Esau. So when Esau is over here, this is a picture from North America, and there he is in his ships, and there is all the mixed nations and Nephilim and stuff here, and he's taking over the land. He's cleaning it up. He's covering up all the artifacts. They leave the Native Americans behind to look after the land and build up the buffalo so they can hunt them when they get there. That's all the stuff Esau is doing. This is why the Mon Mongoloid Native Americans always talk about the fact that they're caretakers of the land. They're caretakers of the land. They were caretakers of the cover-up. This is the difference between Esau and Jacob. Nagid means prince, captain, leader, noble, Jacob. The Naga is the snake related to Turtle Island America and the Caduceus serpent, and that is Esau. Manega, Manega is the symbol of the Nega. That's why they call you Nega, because they're trying to call you the serpent leader. But in truth, you are the noble leader, captain, prince. So Strong's H5057, Nagid matches the Hebrew Nagid, which occurs 44 times in 44 verses in Hebrew. Ruler, prince, captain, leader, governor, nobles, excellent things. Nega, Strong's H5060, to, to strike or smite, plague, beat, cast, bring near. Nega are the divine, semi-divine deities or semi-divine race. So serpent, reptilian, half-human race that reside in the netherworld that can occasionally take human form. Rituals devoted to these supernatural beings have been taking place throughout Asia for at least 2000 years. And they are principally depicted in three forms, holy human with snakes on the heads and necks, common serpents, or as half human, half snake beings in Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Janissaries, Janus and Jambres, Jania. A female Naga is a Nagai, Nagin. Nagini, as seen 
In the Negas or Neganis, they are common and hold cultural significance in the mythological traditions of many South Asian and Southeast Asian cultures. They are called the Rishi or, or, or Kadru. All right, they are also knots that are tied to keep you in bondage. All right, so they're knots. Don't be a nag or a nega. This is what the, the Zagway dynasty looked like, okay? The kingdom of Bar Nagasi. So we see the word Negro, Nagasi, all right? But Nagasi can also, it's got the, the Z-E here. It can also mean Nega or Negad. We don't know which one. And so like we've talked about, Dan sides with Esau, right? And starts working with him. He's the snake, right? So this is the, the Zagwe dynasty and Zagwe dynasty. And so this is what they look like. And they're made up of a number of different tribes, okay? And we've already talked about the fact that Manasseh had Afar, had one of their sons named Afar, so did Judah, and so did Keturah and Abraham. So these are clearly descendants of Israel. And so this particular tribe that was ruling as the Ethiopians were the Djibouti and the Eritreans and the Afar tribes, okay? And included them among them is Danakil, Dan, okay? And this is the Afar, okay? So these are descendants of Israel. And you see, they look very much like African Americans and, and Jamaicans. They have very similar kind of a look, all right? His eyes have been kind of doctored, so don't rely on the eyes in this photo. But we know the half tribe of Manasseh had a son named Ephar, Ephar, okay? And the sons of Midian included Ephar, okay? And this is spelt with the tent peg, Ephar, Ephar. Okay. So the Oromo are a huge ethnic group that currently dominates southeastern Ethiopia and some parts of North Kenya. There are around 25 million Oromo at the moment. One of them is, so this is the other, this is now another group. There is a group of Edomites who overthrew these guys. So that is the Amalekites. The Zagwe dynasty was overthrown by Yakuno Amalek, who claimed descent from Solomon. Well, no, they didn't have descent from Solomon because they're Esau and founded the Solomonic era of Ethiopia, the dynasty that lasted until 1974 and ended with a coup d'etat and deposition of Haile Selassie. So Haile Selassie is an Edomite. He is of Amalek. And you can tell because there's a certain look that they have. And now they're responsible for the Kibra Nagas. But here, let's take a look at them. We have Nipsey Hussle, who looks just like the young. This is the difference between Esau and Jacob. Looks just like the young Haley Selassie. We also have this actor, very famous actor who played Salieri in Amadeus. But he's an Italian, and the Italians were mixed with Zippo the son of Esau, who, who took over Chittim and ruled in Chittim with Janus and Jambres, and we consulted with his brother, one of his brothers, Baal, who, who also taught Janus and Jambres witchcraft, and then they oppressed Israel in Egypt. That was Chittim, who is Rome, and Esau. Okay, so you see how similar these guys look. And here is more on the genealogy of Esau. Now we have them represented here. This is a Roman fresco because you see the head shape of the Esarians is more like this, more heart-shaped head shape, okay? 
and they were the Romans. So these are all, this is all of his genealogy here. Book of Jasher says that in those days they buried Zipho, all right, in the 22nd year of the reign of Moses. So Zipho was reigning in Chittim while Moses was reigning in Cush after he left Egypt. This is when he mixes in with Chittim. Chittim is one of the sons of Japheth. And, it's, and Latinus reigned over the children of Chittim 40 years. And Janus and Jambres and Jania were all part of that. They became Rome. And it says in the book of Jasher, Abanius, king of Chittim, ruled over Edom and fought against the inhabitants of Britannia. Chittim and Edom became one kingdom. Edom and their government was with the children of Chittim and their king. And so, and the Kibra Nagas, which the Ethiopians talk about, is a very odd book because it's very Egyptian. Now, the other books, like if you look at Jasher, Jubilees, a lot of them are quite reliable, and I think that the other Ethiopians kept those. But when it comes to the Kibber Nagas, let's see what it says about the Kibber Nagas. I'm trying to get this on the screen. But anyway, it says the Kibber Nagas, this is coming right out of the book in the, in the introduction of the Kibber Nagas. It says the kings of Ethiopia were descended from Menelik, were of a divine origin, and that their words and deeds were those of God. So they're saying that that's who they descended from. Now the divine origins of the kings of Ethiopia, the Sudan and Egypt is very old and appears to be, have been indigenous. According to the legend, in the West Car Papyrus in Berlin, so this is very Egyptian, this is not Israelitish. Three of the great kings of the fifth dynasty in Egypt were sons of the god Ra by Rutet, wife of Roser, high priest of Ra. So this is what they're saying about the Ethiopians. So some of them probably are and then some of them are not. And it says that many a king of Egypt states in his inscription that he reigned in the egg. There's no eggs in Israel. This is very snake, serpent. Serpents, serpents are hacks through cockatrice eggs. So this is very, this is very um, satanic and Egyptian. And then it says, we understand the egg was deposited in his mother from the form of the sun god who was his father. Okay, so this is, I think it's about um, Simarinus, really, and all that. It says, we learn from the first section of the Colophon that he, the wonderful God, had neglected to have the Arabic version of the Kibber Nagas tr translated into the speech of the Abyssinia. So we have Arabs, and so when we're talking about Arabs and stuff, we're talking about Esau and Ishmael, Okay. The speech of the Abyssinians is, is Amharic, okay? But it's not, the Kibber Nagas was not written in Amharic. It was written in Arabic. Who made the Arabic translation from the Coptic did not make a rendering into Ethiopic also. So why wouldn't it be in Ethiop Ethiopic? Why is it just in Arabic? Because it's probably not related to the Ethiopians originally because Amalek took over the kingdom. And it says a thousand years later, a story arose in Egypt to the effect that Alexander the Great was the son of the god Amun of Egypt. Okay. Alexander the son, is the son of Amun, and he's the lawful king of Egypt. Well, Alexander the Great is also related to Esau Edom. So you see the connections, right? Alexander the Great is also related to the Egyptian kings via Amalek. Amalek is the son of Eliphaz. What comes out of the line of Eliphaz are some of the Ramses. So not only do the priests who persecute Israel in Egypt come out of Esau's line, but so do their kings, Ramses. What color was Ramses' hair? Esau is known to be red. Adam means red. Edom equals red. 
So Ramses II was an Edomite, Hittite, Egyptian descendant of Duke Amalek. Duke, Duke Amalek was a descendant of Esau. See, right here. From Timnah, from Eliphaz to Amalek, then to Ramses Seti. You see, this is where they got their red hair trait. The greatest pharaohs in history, Ramses II had red hair. An angel or prince, Amalek. Previous attempts to study the DNA of mummified remains were inconclusive. The hot climate of Egypt combined with embalming practices, practices by the Egyptians destroyed most DNA. That's probably not true. Researchers <laughs> sampled 150 mummies from Abasur el-Malek. El-Malik, that's like a very Arabic name, about 60 miles from Cairo, Cairo, and their samples span 1,300 years of ancient Egyptian history. From about 1388 BC, Egyptians were more closely related to populations from the Near East and Southwest Asia. So that would be like the Assyrians and the East Indians and the Chinese. And that would be Mount Seir, Assyrians, Mount Hermon, where the angels came down. This is the seed of the fallen. Kibber Nagast is supposed to contain an account of how the Queen of Sheba met King Solomon and how the Ark of the Covenant came to Ethiopia with their son Menelik. And it discusses the conversion of the Ethiopians from the worship of the sun, moon, and stars to that of Yahuwah, the Elohim of Israel. Okay, but this is what's in the premise, in the preface, the introduction. All right, so it's supposed to be not just a liter literary work, but a repository of Ethiopian national religious feelings. In the, in the story, Menelik is supposed to have accidentally captured and spirited away the Ark from Solomon, King Solomon. Menelik simply wanted a tassel from the Ark, but Solomon gave him a cloth, but his Menelik's entourage smuggled the ark away and it spirited them quickly back, flying back to Ethiopia and remained with them. Kibernegas in it, no mention is made of the mercy seat and the cherubim, but we read that Moses made a case in the shape like a belly of the ship. So you're talking about the marine kingdom. You're talking about Satan's realm. Anytime you're talking about marine, you know, the water and ships, that's all Satan's law, Satan's realm. And in this, the two tables of the law were placed to the Ethiopians. This case was symbolized by the Virgin Mary. So, and the case made by Moses carried the world in stone and Mary carried the world incarnate. Well, yeah, this is not, this is not at all Hebraic. This is very Egyptian. All right, so let's go on to the fall of the Temple of Israel. Abraham was very clear that Jacob was the son of the promise seed. And Yah says, Esau I have hated, but Jacob I have loved. And that's in Genesis. So you can't get it any confused. Yah hated Esau. And so because of that, Esau sold his blessing. Isaac was disobedient and to the command of Abraham and Abba. And then Jacob had to steal it back and then got in trouble. And so Isaac was disobedient, and so he blessed Esau and told Esau he would get an advantage, and that's why Esau is the end of the world. Because he would live, the blessing was, you'll live off the dew of heaven and the fat of the earth, and you'll live by the sword. So war took over the whole earth as a consequence. So, this is from the history of the Idumeans, the sarcophagus of ancient civilization. And what happened was at the fall of the temple, Julius Caesar appointed Antipater, we just saw him in the genealogy, who was a clever but crafty Idumean as procurator of Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And we already talked about how everyone became Jews in the time of Esther when Haman was strung up. And so when Antipater was appointed over this area, he was an Edomite. And the Roman Senate appointed Herod as king of the Jews, and he later became known as Herod the Great, who killed all the Jewish children, the babies. All right. 
He was an Idumean. He established his brother-in-law, the Idumean Costobarus, as a priest of cause, as a ruler of Idumea and Gaza. And this was the beginning of the Herodian dynasty. Henceforth, the Idumeans were reckoned as Jews and their land was counted as one of 11 tetrarchies of Judea. So they weren't really Jews, but they were regarded as then. But the union between them and the Jews proved of little blessing. Rather, they became an element of weakness to the Jews in the moment they, of need. They treacherously betrayed them to Rome. By nature, they were cruel and barbarous, fierce and turbulent. At the time of the Romans under Titus, besieged Jerusalem 70 AD, the Idumeans, along with the Zealot party, early joined in the rebellion against the foe. Through the influence of John of Gashishla, and Jos as Josephus informs us, 20,000 Idumeans were allowed to access the holy city only to fill the city with robbery and bloodshed. They spared nobody. The outer temple was completely covered with blood. 8,500 perished there in one day. But the rage of the Idumeans was not confined to the temple precincts. They betook themselves to the city and plundered every house and slew everyone they met most ruthlessly. They massacred the priests, even standing with their coarse feet upon their bodies to defile them and casting them forth without respectful burial. Even An Ananas, the high priest, fell a victim to their savage rage. Remember that name, Ananas, the high priest, Anansi, Ananas, fell victim to their savage rage. He was a just and venerable man, Josephus tells us, noble, dignified, a lover of liberty and democracy. Hmm, I don't know. Preferring peace above all things. After his death, the massacre of the other priests, the bloodthirsty Idumeans fell upon the people in general as upon a flock of profane animals and cut their throats wherever they caught them. Those who escaped immediate death were scourged and tortured until they died. Those whom they caught, so they tortured them to death, those who they caught in the daytime were slain in the night and their bodies were carried out and thrown away that there might be room for other prisoners. And the terror that was upon the people was so great that no one had courage enough to either weep openly for the dead man that was related to him or bury him. Those who were shut up in their own houses could only shed tears in secret lest any of their enemies should hear them. For if they did, those that mourned for others soon underwent the same death as those for whom they mourned. Probably this is going on in Nigeria. With the tragic fall of Jerusalem, the Idumeans, as a nation, pass off the stage of history and disappear entirely from human sight. So this is in 70 AD. They now subsume themselves in the identity of Israel. It says later rabbinical writers continue to use the name Edom. And it's a designation for Rome and Idumea to indicate the southern part of Palestine and the Negev as late as the time of Jerome. All right, so the Negev is related to Esau. So surely Isaac drew an accurate picture of Esau when he said, By thou sword thou shalt live. War and raping were their chief profession. By the sword of Mount Se by the sword they got Mount Seir, and by the sword they exterminated the Horites, except for the women and the boys. They long battled with their brethren, the children of Israel. And he did. He said, "When you break your yoke of the brother off of you, that was the blessing that Isaac gave him. Then by the sword they would live." All right. So now they go into hiding under these various identities as they take over the identity of Israel and they work through the other sons of Abraham and the sons of Israel. The Prester John letter may at least in part have Jewish roots in the desert that separates the mountains from the sandy sea. The writer tells us the underground rivulet turns into a large river with an abundance of precious stones. This is the one we're talking about. Beyond this river he goes on are 10 tribes of the Jews who, though they pretend to have their own kings, are nevertheless our servants and tributaries.
says his domains are twice as great as all of Christendom. It says uh, in an English version of the 1507, for example, the weak kings of the above passage become a great king of Israel, whom Prester John concedes to be twice as strong as I am. His dominions are twice as great as all of Christendom and Turkey, and he hath under him 300 kings, 4,000 princes and dukes and earls and barons and knights and squires without number. Here he seems to have become an alternate version of Prester John himself. So it may be that these are a number of different kings, or this is an amalgamation, and then he's ruling over all of them, and he travels around, and you'll find that that's true. There's other books that reveal more of that. It seems likely that some sort of identification between Prester John and the King of Israel between this remote realm of Christians and the final refuge of the ten tribes lies buried in the very sources of this legend. This possibly seems very close to the surface in the early Central Asian version provided by Hugh of Yabala with its intimations of Tartars and of the kings of the Khazars. So this is conflating the Khazarians, the Khazarian conversion with the 10 tribes. And the 10 tribes were in that realm, but you know, we, that's why we have Masa Musa there when Columbus finally arrives because they're over in America. But yes, they did mix in somewhat with the Russians, but it's only six of the 10 tribes did because Simeon, Ephraim and Manasseh returned to build the second temple. So it was Dan and it was Issachar and Gad and those other ones that were up. Primarily Dan that, Dan that was up there in the Mongolian lands. But it seems like Prester was ruling around there. So it says Jewish traveler Benjamin of Tudila described a relationship he heard about when the four lost tribes in a nomadic people called Kofar and Turak in the Central Asian steppes. The Kofar al Turak. So that's al Turik. That's an that's Arabic name. Evidently, we're not Christians. Al Turik. That's. But their purported relationship with some of the lost tribes resembles that of Prester John and could have had something to do with the making of the latter's legend. So this is what I mean. Like at, at the beginning of this video, I think I mentioned that there's a whole pattern that keeps being repeated as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. So it was the Midianites who sold Joseph to the Ishmaelites who then sold him to the Egyptians. And then it is the Midianite, the same Midianite priest and Zephora who help Moses to leave Egypt. And then they go out of the Exodus. And meantime, they're safeguarding all the Holy Land and they're, they're holding on to the priestly tenants, the Midianites. So this is what's happening. And you listen to the Ishmaelites and they'll, or the Arabs, and they'll say, you know, we're not letting those people back into the land until the sun rises from the west. And that's when they come back to the land. Same story. It's over, same story over and over again. All right, and so it says that, but the most probable Jewish source for the Prester John letter we know of is a narrative of a curious figure of Jewish history, Eldad the Danite. So Dan... Making his appearance towards the end of the ninth century, Eldad traveled through Mesopotamia, North Africa, and Spain, sojourning with Jewish communities in these places and, and telling them the astounded story that their rabbis and scholars took quite seriously. He said that he was a member of the tribe of Dan and was now living with three of the other lost tribes beyond the rivers of Ethiopia. So there's Dan. Dan had left the kingdom of Israel long before the conquest by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, for it had refused to participate in Jeroboam's revolt against Solomon's son Rehoboam and had gone into exile. Instead, the Danites had thought at first of going to Egypt, but it was forbidden to, for them to return to the scene of their ancient servitude. So instead, they went up the river of Pishon until they reached the land of Ethiopia where they found fertile 
with numerous vineyards and gardens. And they were followed by three other tribes, Naphtali, Gad, and Asher. And they crossed the desert, came to the land of the Danites, and they slew many Ethiopians in a territory extending four days journey in each direction. And they have been fighting with the seven kingdoms up to this day. So I want to talk about Septimus Severus. All right. Septimus Severus. These are the seven nations that Abraham fought. The seven nation army. You know the song? Na, 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 na. Well, the seven nation army. That's That's who the seven nations are. They were defeated by Abraham. They were defeated by Levi and Simeon. And it's as it was in the beginning, so it shall be in the end. Again, right? Septimus Severus. Sept. Victorious Septimorum. So the seven nations. Septentrio. You'll see it all over these ancient maps. It's the seven nations because we're in the age of Hasetan. And the seven nations are the children of the fallen angels. And look at where they are. They're up here. Right? In the north. Behold the army from the north. Okay, down here is Persia. Pago, they call it Peru, but it's Perusia. Persia. Because it's Shemitic land. Tolteca. Toltec. Toltec is North America. All right, so I just want to show you that because it's on so many maps. But who is Septimus Severus? Okay. Lucius, Lucifer, Septimus Severus, a Roman Empire from 193 to 211. He was born in Lapitus Magna, etc., Roman province of Africa. Okay, this is Esau Edom. As a young man, he advanced through the customary succession of offices under the reigns of Marcus Aurelius and Commodus. Severus seized power after the death of Emperor Pertinax in 193 during the year of the five emperors. Okay, um, and he fought his rival claimants, the Roman generals Persinius Niger and Collodius Albinus. So Al Albinus, these are Arabic names. Why? Because this is Esau. Esau is Rome. Claudius Albinus and Persinius Niger. It says Niger was defeated in 194 at the Battle of Esau. Esus. Esus Christ, the fake Jesus. Not Yahusha, the real savior. Esus. In Cilicia, later that year, Severus waged a short punitive campaign beyond the eastern frontier tier X, annexing the kingdom of Osseroni as a new province. And then he defeated Albinus three years later. And he waged a war against the Parthian Empire. What is the Parthians? The Persians. You have, this is why Hebrew is so valuable, because with Hebrew you can just see the consonants and you see the name returns, because it's the vowels that change. And sometimes the consonants change, but it's usually sounding like the same word expanding the eastern frontier to the Tigris. He then, see how, do you see the massive movements over lands these people are making because of Pangaea? The land masses were closer together and also they, they traveled greater distances on their ships and they also had planes. We won't get into that. This is his wives and stuff. So Severus traveled to Britain in 208, strengthening Hadrian's Wall and reoccupying the Antoine Wall. In, two, in AD 209, he invaded Caledonia, modern Scotland, with an army of 50,000 men. 
and then he became fatally ill with an infectious disease and he died in Eboracum, Eboracum. So this is the land of the Hebrews, right? York. He died in Iraq, Moon, England. And he was succeeded by his sons. And they thus founded the Severan dynasty. Why? Because Esau, Edom was mixed in with the seven nations. And what does Revelation 17, 9 say? Here is the mind which has wisdom. The seven heads are the seven mountains upon which the woman sits. Nation, army that Abraham fought, Esau is genetically integrated with the seven nations. And like I said, Levi, Simeon, and Judah also fought them when they took Dinah. Just in this slide, that America is called Septeronia. So this is the age of the seven nations, Septeronia. This is when Prester John is ruling these lands, the seven nations age, okay? Septeronia. All right, and I'm going to, I'll talk about Septeronia in a bit, but I just wanted to add something to it. Prester John ruled in Egypt seven mountains. Okay, around the times of the Arab conquest, there was a Jewish king of Septimania in the state of southern France, and he is the son of the first Jewish king of Septimania, also called Theodoric Machir. And now Tuedros, you know, he's ruling the World Health Organization. Machir. This is Makor, Kor means West. On the death of his father, Makor Theodoric, in about 765 AD, Nehemiah Theodoric becomes the Western exilarch and leader of all the Jews of the revived Western Roman Empire of Charlemagne. So he is the king of the seven nations. Again, Septrio seven nations. Another one, he was the African conqueror of Britain. The seven nations conquer Britain. All right. Leading conquerors, Septimus Severus, one of the leading conquerors of Britain was African. How much of any Negro strain, <laughs> they question it, right? This is from Nature Knows No Color Line, though. All right, and so this just goes into some of the, there was a Negro named Hadrian. Hadrian, when you're talking about Hadrian or Herod, you're talking about Roman descendants of Esau, Edom. Right, and it says here, Theodore, an Oriental, was named in his place, and Hadrian went as his mentor. So they tried to, in 668, Pope Valentin, but Vitalian appointed a Negro, Hadrian, Archbishop of Canterbury, but he declined because of age. And then Theodore, an Oriental, so this is Tuedros, two doors, the Tudors, Theodore, an Oriental, so an Ethiopian was named in his place. So around the time of these conquests of the Romans and up in Britain and stuff, the diaspora had fanned out a little bit more into Africa and yet on the eastern side still remained the Arabs and Esau and the Midianites and so forth. And they began to amalgamate together. So what the Edomites and Ishmaelites and Hagarians did as they began to conquer the lands in towards the north and in North Africa and Europe, Western Europe, so-called Western Europe, which is Shem's land, they conscripted the Hebrews to do it because the Hebrews were the best warriors. And so they forced converted them. And so what they did was they had to get North Africa first and then they had to go on into Spain. Out of the Western Sudan would come a great general, Tarak Ben Zad, a Jabaral Tarak. 
he would discover a weakness in Spain fighting the Goths and the Visigoths and the Vandals fighting among themselves. The dissident element in Spain would do something white people rarely ever do. They would sneak across into Africa and tell the Africans how weak the whites are and said they are so weak if you want to conquer them it's an easy thing to do. Jabral would send a testing army by 10,000 just to test our lines. You find it is easy. Then later he would send 60,000. He would take Spain. Now this is purely an African conquest. You are not dealing with the Arab conquest of Spain at first because the Arabs were not there at first. The initial conquest of Spain was African, not Arab. That army came from the Senegambia, now Senegal, and parts of what is now Mauritania. And when they moved over and conquered Spain, Madame Bagiba has written a book on it that bears the name, Tarak Ben Zad. And she describes the army going into Spain. She says the army was black as ink. The general was blacker still. Musa ibn Nusayr was going to bring order to chaos. He led an absolutely brutal campaign of conquest, and it was said that during his offensives, he managed to capture 300,000 people and sent them all back to the slave markets of Egypt. By 708, he had successfully taken Morocco and had subjugated the city of Tangier, installing as governor a man named Tariq ibn al-Zaid, Musa's right-hand man in future endeavors. By the year 709, most of North Africa was now in Arab hands. Trade began to expand, and the cities of Fustat, Karouan, and Tangier became administrative centers for control. Even the Berbers, seeing which way the wind was blowing, began to adopt the new religion and began signing up to join the Arab army. I guess, if you can't beat them, join them. Now some of the Gaul and Christian um, Gentile nations were up there as well. And so as the prophecy is to Ephraim, he would mix in with these Gentile nations. This was the first official conquest, and he was a Berber. And he was going to fight against and defeat King Roderick. And there was a table belonging to King Solomon in the land that showed that the Jews and the ten tribes were already there rash and headstrong young king named Roderick resolved to penetrate the tower's secret and against the advice of all of his counselors he had the 27 padlocks opened. He then entered the chamber within and upon its walls were painted Arab horsemen, scimitars at their belts, spears brandished in their right hands. In the middle of the room stood a table made of gold and silver set with precious stones. Upon it carved the words, This is the table of King Solomon, son of David, upon whom be peace. There was an urn on the table which was found to contain a scroll of parchment. When this was unrolled, the following words were revealed. Whenever this chamber is violated and the spell contained in this urn is broken, the people painted on these walls will invade Spain, overthrow its kings, and subdue the entire land. End quote. With his 7,000 men, he crossed into southern Spain and landed near the port city of Algeciras. Now, as I've mentioned, this was initially to be considered a large raid, and Tarek kept his men near the coast and by the port in case they needed to be evacuated. It was now that Musa and Tariq looked across a relatively narrow expanse of water, a body that would one day be named the Strait of Gibraltar. The shores of Iberia lay beyond, tempting, inviting, and rich. It was here that an old kingdom was ready to fall. Spain was ripe for the taking. 
Tariq, meanwhile, pushed on to the capital city of Toledo, which at this point had been largely abandoned. He took the city and secured the land around it. He then stationed his men there for the winter of 711 to 712. And if you think about it, this is not a bad campaigning season. This is what a general would call a very auspicious beginning. Now, during this time, Musa ibn Nusayer was sitting back in North Africa and watching Tariq put on his dazzling performance. He had, after all, captured a port city and taken Cordoba and secured the capital and, of course, took out a Visigoth army. Tariq had basically taken a raid and turned it into a war of conquest and had managed not to die horribly in the process. Musa now realized that he was missing out on what was turning into a very lucrative affair. And so he mobilized 18,000 men, experienced veterans, mind you, and in June of 712, he brought these men into the port city of al Hasiras, you know, much like Tariq had done before him. Now, he spent the summer securing the southern tip of Spain and then advanced to Seville and finally onwards to Merida. Merida, being a substantial city, took a considerable amount of time via siege, in fact, the entire winter of 712 to 713 to conquer, and with a considerable amount of bloodshed. Other areas opted to do it the easy way. They were given a diplomatic option, like the governor Theodomer of Mercia, which I've also heard as Murcia, which is an area in southeastern Spain. He was given a treaty, and the terms were fairly benign. He was given autonomy and the option for religious tolerance in exchange for paying his taxes on time, which, of course, beats being killed. And for the Arabs, it allowed them freedom to move on to other targets. So after this successful campaign season, albeit it was a bit bloody, Musa eventually joined up with Tariq in Toledo. After exchanging the necessary pleasantries, they got down to the awkward affair of resolving who got what in terms of spoils. It was about now that Musa really had to pull rank. Apparently, they got into a real spat over the jeweled table that I mentioned earlier, the, you know, the one that was considered to be the Table of Solomon. After a lot of back and forth, Musa ultimately got it, but not before Tariq managed to pull off one of the legs and replace it with a more rudimentary variant. You know, it got really childish, but luckily nobody got their eye poked out. After Musa essentially got the lion's share and the two men hugged and made up, they set off to the northeast in 714 to capture the Ebro River Valley, and then they went on to take out Zaragoza and Lierda, and Barcelona, or Barcelona. However, they didn't stop there. They crossed the Pyrenees and took a chunk of southern France called Narbonne. The thought process here was that this area would be a launching pad for further conquest as it became readily apparent to both men that there were still lands to be plundered on the other side of the mountains. So let me ask you this. If you were a war correspondent at this point in history, what would you report back at this point? Good chance is that you'd probably say that the conquest was going great. You know, medals all around kind of thing. Now, the average person out there, if you do a fantastic job at whatever it is that you do, there's a good chance that you're going to get some sort of recognition. And if you're really lucky, you might even get promoted. However, news of Tariq and Musa's success began to worry the caliph, who issued a command to recall both men back to Damascus. He was concerned, and perhaps rightfully so, that Musa was going to go ahead and carve out a kingdom for himself. Indeed, as Musa left Spain, he placed his own son, Abd al-Aziz ibn Musa, in charge, which some can argue was the beginning of a dynastic structure. In late 714, perhaps early 715, Musa and Tariq made the extended journey back to Damascus. The caliph, who had just come to power at the time, was Suleiman ibn Abd al-Malik, who, let's just say that he didn't have that warm, fuzzy center for Musa as many of his predecessor caliphs had. Suleiman, who straight out just didn't like Musa, stripped him of all of his titles and spoils and rendered him, at least in some stories, a complete and total beggar, abandoned by all, including his servants. But this wasn't going to be the final statement of Musa's last days. More on that in a bit. As for Tariq, he simply disappeared from the record. And I'm willing to guess his 
retirement, let's call it, wasn't exactly a benign one. Going back to Spain for a second, in his absence, Musa's son, Abd al-Aziz, continued the conquest of Spain, bringing most of Lusitania, which is what we think of as modern-day Portugal, and the northwestern areas such as Leon, under his control. Suleiman, again the man who brought down Musa, heard about this. He put out a hit on Abd al-Aziz, who was thus promptly assassinated. And if the tale is to be true, he wasn't just killed. He was decapitated, his head put into a jar of vinegar, and then shipped back to Damascus. And check this out. When he got back there, Suleiman held a lavish feast for his father, Musa, dragging him out of the gutter for a night, and during the meal, in the midst of dinner conversation, the caliph presented Abd al-Aziz's head to him on a silver platter. Talk about driving home a point in a kind of insanely cruel way. Despite all this that happened to these two Hebrews, they did conquer Spain because Jacob is the former of all things. And to this day, Tawik is still the name of this rocky, desolate place, which could have been where the true temple of Israel was housed at the center of Arabia and Israel. And so once again, as Musa... His father was a Hebrew who was converted and dwelt in the Caliph's temple. That's how he was converted to Islam. And this is how all the Berbers were conver converted to Islam. So careful now when they, you hear these, be, these men being called Arabs and Africans because they were Yasharal in force converted to Islam. It was prophesied that they would worship gods of wood and stone, and so this is how they came to worship this god of stone. The Africans and Arabs create a rich, cultured, and powerful empire. So powerful, it endures for 500 years. The achievement of the Arabs at this time is they have driven the Europeans out of the Mediterranean. The European now must go back into Europe. They have no empires, no great connections outside of Europe. And because of this, they ultimately would go into a period called the Dark Ages. Militarily, the Africans took over Spain, and militarily, the Africans held Spain until 1240 while the Arabs did come in but the military hold on Spain was African now let's look at the Africans and the Arabs that combination called Moors in Spain what did they do? for a while in history there were only two great universities the University of St. Cori at Timbuktu and the University of Salamanca in Spain. And the African was solely in charge of the one at St. Cori and partly in charge of the one at Salamanca. They built public schools. They built public baths. They gave Spain the greatest civilization it has known before or since. They built a great university, Salamanca. They translated the great works of the masters of Europe, including a lot of work they had stolen from Africa. Europe had forgotten its own masters. The Africans translated it. But their performance and the partnership between the Africans and the Arabs and the Berbers in Spain was a long and beneficial partnership and a fine moment in their history and in world history. The African and the Arab and Islam had united and held Europe at bay for almost a thousand years. It's showtime! Moors.
It's around this time also that word reaches. This is during the reign of Abd er Rahman III. Word reaches the court of Cordova about the existence of a nomadic people in the Central Asian steppes called the Khazars, whose king and upper class had been converted to Judaism some 200 years before under circumstances that remained obscure. And the caliph's first minister, Hastai ibn Shaprut, a Jew, responded to the news by writing an exciting letter, excited letter to the Khazar king, since the first reports on the Jewish Khazars had not mentioned the fact that they were converts. Hastai thought they might be descended from the lost tribes. Now, of course, six of the lost tribes might have gone in that direction, but that's kind of the climate. And as well, the, the Israelites are kind of having their own little renaissance in Spain at the time as well as we've seen. So before we go any further, we're going to begin to tie in the Turks to the Arabs. And we already mentioned the Janissaries, Janius, Jam, Jam, Jambres, right? So I want to make the connection with the Arabs and their conquests of the Gentiles and enslavement of them, and then their, in turn, conquest of the Arabs and their, their rising up through as Gentiles and in the area of Tartaria. All right, so I want to relate back to the priests of On. Okay, the priests of On, and this is the Muslims. So this is this is a picture of Ayob, who was a slave trader in the late 1500s. But I'm just using him as an image. He's got the red book around his neck. These are the. Um, Fulanis. These are the true Muslims, Edomite Muslims. They are not white, they're black. Okay. Now, this is a reference to them. Kara Koi Unoli were a tribal confederation of Ogus Turkic nomadic tribes from Ongus tribe of Yawa which existed in the 14th and 15th centuries in Western Asia and the ta ta on the territory of modern Azer Azerbaijan, Armenia, Iraq, and Northwestern Iran and Eastern Turkey. So when you're talking about that, that's the land of Shem. The union of the two states, the Russian horde and the Ottomans and Tamans and Ottoman Empire equal Ottomania. Ottomania. So Taman, again, was one of the sons of Esau. The biblical conquest of the promised land is the horde, Ottoman conquests of the XV century. Forgive me. So Uz, Iob, this is the son of Esau, land of Esau, in the early 15th century trace Osmans, the land of Oz, right? Where, who came from the land of Oz? Job, Iob. This is, this guy's name was Iob, Job. Trace Osman's genealogy to the Og Hus Kegan. So these are the Turkic Og Hus Kegan. So this is going to become Khan through their senior grandson of his senior son. So giving the Ottoman Sultan's primacy among the Turkish monarchs. And he quotes this as follows. It says, from the tribe Etu Gro, from the tribe of Kayi, his son Osman Bey, Osman House, and the Beys on the frontier, the houses on the frontier, held an assembly when they had consulted each other and understood the custom of the Agus Khan, they appointed Osman Khan. So mm -hmm. here's the connection to the priests of On, the Karas, the people of Oz and Job, descendant of Esau, all connected to the Osman Khan. All right. 
And then the identity called more was then taken over by the black Arabs and next by the white Arabs, the Turks, who were both a combination of the Ottoman Empire, and Ottoman comes from the word Tayman. Tayman was one of the sons of Edom, and they dwelt in the land of Uz or Oz, so Oz Tayman, that's how you get Ottoman and they mixed in with Japheth, the Turks, so that's how you get Ottoman Turks. As I said before, the Edomites and the Ishmaelites and the Hagarians, all of these sons of Abraham, illegitimate sons of the descendants of Abraham, went up north into the land of the Khazarians and conquered and enslaved them as Slavic people. And they did so as the Arabs. But as I said before in the previous videos, the Janissaries of these people took on perfectly the identity of the Arabs and became the Turkic Arabs. But while this was still going on, this was when the Moors, who were known as Yasharel. So in the 1300s to Charles VI of France, they're saying all they knew of the world was what's portrayed in these Okonome maps, which is just... Europe and Asia and Africa. Um, and so that was called the inhabited world. I've showed you guys maps of that before. And essentially this was Europe, Asia, and North Africa surrounded by an ambiguous assortment of islands. Any hints of Africa south of the Sahara or the Americas or the rest of the world as we know it belonged to the realm of myth and conjecture rather than that of reasonably exact science. And that's because the Gentiles were now taking over and they didn't hadn't really ruled all over the world or traveled all over the world, although parts of sections of them did, but as on the whole as a people they didn't. So this is how this was accomplished. So here we see one of the Catholic kings of Edom, one of the Presters, the Prester Johns to become the priest kings, all right? The Prester Johns that became the Pope kings, the Holy Roman emperors. And this is a true Edomite, it looks like. So the Jewish Encyclopedia recounts many of the names of the true Israelites, especially descendants of Joseph, Solomon, and Dawid. And you know there's a difference between them and everyone else calling themselves Jews because you see it in the name. Here is the genealogy of Judah ben Yaish and Judah ibn Yahya, and you see the Yahya descendants from 1055 down to 1300 to 1333, 1385, 1430, all the way up through the 15 and 1600s, and ending around 1650. Yuda ibn Yaya Negro ben David. So of course that's Judah and um, son, Negro, son of David. Okay, born in Toledo in the middle of the 14th century together with his brother Solomon. He emigrated to Portugal in the year of terror. So that was from Spain and Judah was employed under Queen Philippa, consort of Jiao, considerable influence with the king. When Vincent Ferrer asked permission to con carry on a propaganda against the Jews in Portugal, the king at the instigation of Judah informed him, Ferrer, that his request would be granted on the condition that he place a red hot crown upon his head. Judah was one of the most prominent poets of his time and wrote several elegies deploring the unhappy fate of his Spanish brethren. We'll have more on Prester John's Pope Kings in the second part. And so thank you so much for watching. I got my prayerful answers on the calendar and I'll probably move over to Tartaria away from Japheth. Okay, so thank you so much for watching. Baruch Atah. Shalom. Please like, subscribe and share, like, subscribe and share. Share this, share it with one another, please, because you got to get out of Babylon. So please um, make donations. Go to intoalltruth.net, which is livelightwell.com. You can get a calendar or a cookbook. I am working on the calendar, but I will keep your name in a list. I'll send you the existing one, and then when I update it, I'll send you the updated one. 
Uh, please make a donation there, $25 or more for each, so that you can keep this channel going and keep me doing my work. I appreciate all donations in the name of Yahusha. May Yah bless you and keep you and cause his face to shine on you. May he be gracious, lift the light of his countenance, and give you peace. All right, so return Yah Yahuwah to the countless thousands of Yasharel. Shuvah Yahuwah Revaot Yasharel. Hallelujah. All praises to the Most High. Like, subscribe, share, donate. Toda, thank you for watching. Israel, we love, worship, and praise Yahweh. Give him thanks by saying hallelujah.